So precision learning uh, and data sharing through wearable technology, I think what's really exciting about this is that you know, in our everyday lives, wearable technology is a part of it. Um, I'm sure a number of you are hacking your life, if you will, getting more information about your body, how you sleep, your heart rate, um, your golf swing. Uh, and I think that it's becoming a mainstream conversation. And the big question is, you know, what if this concept was applied to what we do as surgeons? Uh, I find it interesting, um, almost uh, hilarious, to be honest, that we can do two, three, and four hour complex operations with amazing anatomy and pathology. And we distill it down to two to three paragraphs when we talk about what we did. And that's, what, that's what's left in terms of, of the uh, documented uh, memory of, of that scenario. And so I, I just want to put that out there. I think part of what I learned along the way with using sensors, um, in quantifying the process of what we do as surgeons is that a lot of this is very much grounded in haptics, which is the science of touch. And that's whether you're touching a patient directly, touching an instrument, touching an organ, and walking away. You know, many of us, there isn't a language to describe what that tumor feels like or what certain um, anatomy feels like. Um, but we walk away with that information on our fingertips. And then we use, you know, sort of weird acronyms or, some, you know, things to, to kind of um, explain what it is that is our experience with touch. And so I will take you on a journey um, regarding wearable technology and haptics and how we have been using it over the past 20 years to understand what it is that we do as surgeons. This is a sampling of some of the sensors that have been a part of my research in my lab over the years. The FSR is a force sensing resistor, and this is the very first sensor that I learned about. Um, it comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Um, this was one that I uh, used when I was a grad student here at Stanford um, after my residency, and it's been tried and true. We still use this plus a version of them. Obviously, the technology has expanded over the years, um, we've partnered a lot with a number of different um, electrical engineers, uh, chemical engineers who actually build these sensors. And then some of them are off the shelf. Some of them have been around for a long time. This type of motion sensor is a magnetic motion tracking sensor, the flexi sensors. But these sensors here, the 3D, the biomimetic MIM sensor, micro electromechanical sensor, and the fabric sensor were all fabricated. Um, and it's just been exciting a journey to collaborate uh, with engineers and explore all these different materials. And I'll share a few other ones um, throughout the talk as we've used them. What's been fun is to think about blending the concept of haptics with actual metrics, um, metrics captured from the sensors, and to be able to track the learning curve. And we all take different paths. Um, it's you know, combined with our own skills, not only haptic, but visual and decision-making. And I will share some of that with you, but my biggest epiphany is grounded in this, which a number of you may have heard this um, quote before by Frank Spencer, that a skillfully performed operation is about 75% decision-making and 25% dexterity. And you know, so dexterity, a lot of people talk about dexterity drills and practicing and who's fastest and are you smooth and you've got a good pair of hands and, you know, but we realize that there is very much what we call this visual haptic loop, meaning we are modifying anatomy and we have a plan. We know the steps of the operation. However, we do take small detours uh, in that plan based on what we see. And so, Every cut, um, dissection, every haptic move that we make with our hand or an instrument changes that anatomy visually, we process that, and then that determines the next haptic move, if you will. And what's been interesting, obviously we don't dictate our operative reports at this level, we would never get out of the hospital, and I think we would probably not be a surgeon if we had to provide that amount of information. 
But when you think about the majority of our communication about our skills, it's verbal. You're either listening or you're actually watching. But what you're watching um, has some limitations. And what I will share with you is the biggest contribution of the wearable technology, the sensor technology to the house of surgery in our profession is that it provides a whole nother layer of visual information that we've never had before. And it's been very exciting to uh, experience this over the years. Uh, Chris mentioned that we had an opportunity at the last in-person uh, clinical Congress meeting. And uh, it was actually at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. Uh, unfortunately, I'm actually not going to talk about much of that data. There, there are some interesting, really interesting results. But this is um, a list of the uh, wearable technologies that we deployed at that meeting um, while we had surgeons uh, do a focus um, procedure on some pig intestines. We had them run the bowel looking for enterotomies. We told them that they had just finished, you know, a two-hour license of adhesions, and now they're running the bowel looking for enterotomies to repair. And we captured all of this data from them, audio, video from their perspective, as well as video um, on the overhead, see how they, you know, work and communicate with their assistants. Um, number of times they reach back and forth from the tray. Most of my talk today will be about the motion tracking. So here's an example. And again, all of the um, wearable technologies that we use, we synchronize them. So we synchronize video with uh, audio as well as the, the uh, motion tracking. And so what I'm going to do is show you two videos. One of them is, both of these were captured actually from the microscope. And what you notice is that the novice, um, this person has good dexterity for the most part. You'll notice they have a little bit of a tremor. Um, and what I'm going to do after the end of sharing these videos with you, we're going to show you their motion profile. And, and it would be very striking to, to sort of see video versus the motion data. This person makes a critical error and they're not tying. And you know, a number of us, we do this all the time, especially if we're tired, but we don't settle for inferior. More people who are more experienced don't settle for inferior conditions. <laughs> um, and this person actually, while they're tying or not, instead of um, pulling the tie, the, the suture side, they actually extend the suture tail that you have to reach for out of the field of view of the microscope. Um, if you've done that by accident because you weren't thinking you were talking, we would usually just cut it, but this person doesn't do that. And so I'll share that with you as you watch. You can see the trimmer. The assistant also comes in and helps them a little bit, but there you go. They're pulling that in. And now they've got to do a whole lot of work to go reach that suture to, to tie these knots. Whereas this person here is a lot more experienced. You pull the tail that's on the side of the needle, so you have more length and you can get more work out of that suture. Um, but you can see the person has to do a lot more, has more working volume with each stitch, reaching to grab that long tail. And by the time they're finishing that, this person's already done. Um, this is motion. This is, a, and unfortunately, it's a 2D computer, so I can't show you the 3D. Um, volume rendered uh, diagram, but let's focus on the expert knot tie first. Um, this is plotted uh, in terms of percent completion. So the dark blue represents the first reaching for the suture tail in the first knot. So this is the reaching for it, the knot um, and tying is taking place here. This is the second one, um, and this is the third. So let's look at the novice. The trimmer shows up. Um, you can also see that they had a much larger and sort of erratic working volume trying to reach. Um, unfortunately, what you can't see is it's going far into the screen um, with this, but just seeing the, even the working volume for the last suture, it does get smaller, you know, comparing the, the blue to the green to the yellow. But think about when you are operating with a resident and you tell them, um, you, know, you give them some feedback on that suture and you just say, yeah, you know, that, that is just not as efficient. You should, you should cut it shorter. 
Um, and the difference between that feedback versus them looking at this, they can see a big difference. Um, you don't even have to give them a lecture about it. And, and they want, you know, they want to be efficient. They want to be the best they can be. And so now we're just looking at these two diagrams, they can go put these sensors on and, you know, see how efficient knot tying can take place so that we don't take the operation over from them because they're failing to progress. You know, this is one small example, but obviously I think you, from a, on a day-to-day -day basis, while you're teaching your residents, you can think of scenarios where it may benefit uh, them to have more um, detailed information or more precise, hence precision learning. Um, precision learning can not only happen, obviously, with, with feedback that is pretty precise. And I would offer that we're really great in picking up what their mistakes are, but the verbal feedback and then giving them a prescription of how to correct it um, is sometimes not as precise as it could be. So my agenda is to show how this data um, maps out technical skills. Um, I will also show how the data maps out some of our cognitive skills, both in terms of technical decisions that we make, um, not with respect to dexterity and how fluent you are, but technical decisions as well as cognitive load. Um, if you, uh, and I'll get to the punchline, if your technical skills aren't to a level of smoothness or automaticity where you're, you know, these instruments are, you are one with your instrument. If you're still trying to figure out your instruments, then it doesn't leave enough cognitive reserve many times to learn a multi-step a complex operation or take care of an unexpected event. You, you, you get a little more frustrated um, than you would if um, your instruments and step-by-step -step motion, kind of like, you know, counting keys when you're playing the piano. Uh, that's, that's a different level of expertise. And then I'll talk a little bit about, about mastery and how we're trying to quantify that and what that looks like. Um, up front again, I will explain, you know, using this Olympic example, um, a lot of people say, well, you know, if you define mastery with this technology, then everybody's going to want to reach and do everything that one way. And I'll explain to you and show you that that's not really the goal. And my, uh, what we are finding is that there's definitely more than one way to skin a cat and get good outcomes. Um, but there are some approaches that are not as effective. Um, my analogy for this is when you think about Olympic ice skating 20 years ago. It looked very different. The athletes had a different body built and a different capability than they do now, but a 10 is a 10. And so um, having metrics doesn't, uh, doesn't leave us stuck in one place in time. Um, it just gives us a, a way of communicating what we're observing. So this is a close-up view of the magnetic motion tracking sensor. The sensor is actually here. The rest of this is a, is a wired system. Um, that goes to a data acquisition unit. And um, the first example I'll give is of a ventral hernia. Unfortunately, I don't have any head and neck surgery procedures. Uh, hint, hint, looking forward to partnering with you all. Um, but this is a ventral hernia uh, scenario. This is a picture of the simulator. It's a tabletop a model. And the benefit of some of these is that you can actually use all of the instruments that you normally use in the operating room. Uh, this is a close-up of the hernia. It's a fairly sizable uh, hernia. And the goal for this procedure um, is to take the, you know, intestines that may be stuck in here, pull them down, and then put mesh um, on the abdominal wall side so that you don't uh, uh, get a strangulation of your intestines. Um, but we collect all of this data, and all of this data is synchronized from this person's view, the video glasses, there's an audio recorder here. Um, similar data as I showed, and we also are able to, we can get video feeds from any camera, and in, um, in this case, obviously, the laparoscopic view. And then we have, um, you know, the tried and true checklist, and because these simulators are pretty inexpensive, the uh, trainees can do a self-assessment. FPA is final product analysis, um, and I'll show you uh, what that is as we proceed. Once we started looking at the data, we did a big study with some second and third year residents who were in the lab. Um, and we did a number of skills. The lab virtual hernia repair was one of them. We did not expect them to have any high levels of expertise, but we wanted to get a data point of, you know, what are the things on the learning curve that you need in order to do a multi-step, you know, laparoscopic operation 
um, after you've done, you know, a basic appendectomy and some gallbladders, like, how do you, you know, what are your, what do your skills need? And it turns out that depth perception is a big deal here. Um, this is uh, a cartoon diagram of the abdominal wall. This is a hernia here. Um, and again, this was over 10 years ago. We don't even repair these hernias this exact way anymore. But just for um, an example, you put uh, four anchoring sutures on the mesh, and then you pull up these sutures, these transfascial sutures, um, to get the mesh in place, and then you use a tacker to, to seal it. And what we notice in the video that you're going to watch, there's, there's a second-year resident who's struggling with depth perception um, and, in terms of trying to grab uh, the transfascial suture. This is the external view using both hands. Um, and watch this grasper. And they initially try to hand the suture to themselves. Then they're holding it taut and trying to grab the suture, but they keep passporting. Every little step that they take, um, we're able to capture that. And um, I'll talk about path length with respect to this data. And this person is someone who would have a longer path length than someone who grabbed the suture the first time because they're moving more. Uh, in terms of the final product analysis, there is a score, a standardized score that exists. The Society of American Gastroendoscopic Surgeons came up with this. Um, multi-item uh, uh, scoring system in terms of the placement of the mesh, for example, and how flat it is, um, placement of your, your tacks and your anchoring sutures, and even the amount of overlay. Um, so there were multiple criteria. And the first thing that we did uh, with this study with the second and third year residents that were in the lab and did these repairs, we looked at the outcome. We looked at who did the, who had the best hernia repairs, who got a perfect final product score versus those who were on the lower end and what did their motion, you know, look like. And just from a qualitative perspective, just looking at them, you can see a big difference. Again, this is one of those 3D plots of every movement that they took. Um, this is in terms of velocity instead of percent completion. So it shows this blue means they're moving slow here. Many times this is when the most important aspects are happening you know, likely when you're, you're making an incision or um, just gathering information from the patient on the next move and transitioning. And so this area here is the patient on the table. This is the male stand. And this is the surgeon standing here. Um, and so you can see when they're spending time with the instruments in their hand going back and forth to the hernia and then going back and forth to the male stand. This is someone who was a lower performer. And you see a whole lot of back from the patient to the male stand, starting and stopping um, and pausing. The other thing you see here is uh, a whole other set of motions that don't appear here on the, uh, for the top performer. And this person made one of their port sites too large and their whole port kept coming out every time they moved an instrument. So they had to put their instrument back on the male stand. Um, and eventually they sutured this closed, but because they only had a, you know, a defined period of time to repair the hernia, you know, they didn't really do a good job. Once we saw that, you know, there is a difference in the pattern and, and again, that path length, um, we wanted to, to look at this statistically. Is there a correlation between the motion metrics um, and smoothness is a velocity metric and it has to do with the velocity in which you change direction, whether you have jerky movement. Um, and working volume, again, is you know, the three-dimensional uh, space in which your hands move path length is if you take some motion plot and stretch it out and measure it. Idle time is when your velocity is really low or zero and you're not moving. And it turns out that there are significant correlation between the actual quality of your repair and your motion. And so if you were less smooth or having lots of um, jerky movements, uh, you have a lower final product score or grade and longer path length, so depth perception. And this, again, gets at what we were talking about with um, some of this is not really just dexterity, but it's also planning. And um, another thing and what we're finding is by manual dexterity does does. Uh, make a difference. But it's also how you work with your team members. 
one of the things we, we wanted to look at now that we knew that the whole motion plot and some of those metrics from that correlate significantly with the outcome, we thought, well, what about the first part of the procedure? Like your first move, could we predict? And we just, we thought it was a, a joke initially to look at this, but it turns out you can tell with some of the, the, the residents where they still aren't as facile with depth perception and using microscopic instruments, it turns out that their first attempt to pull up that anchoring suture predicts whether they're gonna finish the, the hernia repair with a, a high level of quality or not. And by the time they pull up the second stitch, I mean, this is amazing. Again, it's, it's the time that it takes to pull up the stitch, it's whether you're assisting yourself by manual dexterity and the path length of your dominant hand. I mean, this really gets at that instrument autonomy thing. And, you know, how do we really dissect? This is a person who got pretty far with the hernia repair. This is the hernia defect. I'm a scene here, I'm a like this here. And then this is the mesh. They made a number of planning errors here, just in terms of them cutting the size of the mesh, how they measured it. Um, and then, planning of their anchoring sutures um, according to the size of the mesh um, really skewed here. And, um, you know, this was someone who who's didn't score zero or eight, but probably scored about a 12. Um, and this is someone who knows how to use the instruments, but they had major problems with, with operative planning. Um, again, you know, final words about instrument autonomy. If you are still figuring out how to assist yourself, how to set up your assistance to assist you such that you are purposeful and smooth in your movements and efficient, um, that is gonna affect your ability um, to make decisions. And um, we realized that a number of these residents forgot the step. They were so frustrated because they, you know, have done this procedure a number of times and they thought they were really good at it, but they didn't realize how much their attendings were helping them, you know? And so that's, that's really a question for us. Do your residents, are they able to make all of the necessary decisions in an operation uh, and also execute from a technical perspective. And that's where you will find whether your um, residents are autonomous in terms of their use with the instruments and they're not, you know, sort of, okay, how do I use this? And, you know, depth perception and, and assisting myself. Um, and, and they're so interrelated. Um, this has been interesting. On the cognitive side, we, we, early on, we did a fundamental experiment, and I'll share that with you. This is, uh, we developed what we call the variable tissue simulator, and it really is different materials that we have some preconceived notion about what it would take to put a suture in, these materials. These materials we experience in our daily life, foam material, rubber balloons, um, especially if you have children or a dog or anything or done any, you know, Home Depot projects. You know these materials. We touch them all the time. I don't think we go around suturing them, but if I asked you to, you would automatically think in your mind, okay, what would it take to put a suture in that and it holds, um, and then tissue paper. And so really what we were looking for was, will the motion sensors pick up the difference in the thought pattern um, of the person who's doing this? Uh, and I just have to comment, this is a different sensor. This is an LED motion sensor, most of our work now, um, we use the magnetic motion tracking because the LED um, requires line of sight with a camera, overhead camera. And so as soon as you supinate um, your hand, then you, we lose data. But this is one of our early studies. And the results uh, show that there is a difference. So just in terms of skill, we know this, that the, the, the attendings finished the uh, suturing. We looked at this is the data I'm sharing with you for the tissue paper. Um, the attendings were were more efficient uh, there. And this is the study. I'm sorry. Every time I look at this, I realize it's 15 students, 15 residents, and 15 attendings. And um, for everybody, regardless of your experience level, everyone had more idle time, or they were slower um, in terms of their, which means that they were planning and being more careful and putting that stitch in. Everybody had more idle time with the tissue paper than the foam and the balloon. What was more interesting is when you look at, you know, this is suturing, but when you think about each of the procedure steps, entering the needle, you know, the tissue with your needle, driving it through, pulling it out, tying a knot, cutting the suture, grasping and, you know, just managing it. 
Um, you look here, everybody, there was more idle time because everyone knows, wow, you know, with this tissue paper, I'm going to tear it with this sharp, sharp needle. So this is where the highest idle time, you know, on average for all of these steps. One of the ones that was really interesting was that the faculty um, had a little more idle time, uh, significantly more idle time than both the residents and the students when they were tying the knot. And um, as you can see, many of the faculty were, were pretty um, successful. And this is with proline, and you know, proline is a lot of memory. Um, and, you know, similar scenario, the student got the suture in, they tied and, you know, they tore for a number of different reasons. Um, but again, looking at where people are idle, that represents your operative planning. And we did post a paper uh, regarding this metric, because most people who look at motion data, they look at the movement. Um, and what we are now, what we added to this, you know, um, field of research is, it turns out that if you look at when people are not moving, it actually means something. Um, and so our summary of that is that that idle time correlates not only with skill level, but it also correlates with task difficulty um, as we pause and make more decisions, take more information in visually and get into that visual haptic loop and, and you know, thoughts before movement. And uh, again, it's surgical planning, decision making, information gathering. And so it's been fun to kind of look at this metric throughout a number of different procedures and where it happens. And it turns out that points where you are idle in a procedure many times, or if you have much slower velocity, that is when you're performing the most important part of the operation. You want to nail that stitch one time. There's some organs and some scenarios that are unforgiving, you know, in terms of a mis, you know, place suture or movements with, with dissecting something very carefully so you don't injure a vessel. Um, those slowing down moments. Um, represent uh, the idle time and low velocity. So we talked about technical example with this uh, wearable technology, a cognitive example, and I'll share some uh, relating to, to mastery. This is a cardiac surgery simulation. And this person has sensors on their left and the right hand. We only pick one. Most times we put three sensors on both hands. For this plot, the sensor on the left hand, you can see that this person is moving just really from left to right. It's the assisting hand. It has a low, a small working volume um, within this space. The right hand um, has this larger movement here. This is when they're pulling the suture through. And these smaller movements here, which if I plotted this with the color for idle time, it would be slower because this is when they're suturing through the tissue, and this is the atrial appendage. I'll share it with you again, because if you look at this motion, um, this repeating pattern where we're pulling the suture through, you see this one is a little different. And the benefit of synchronizing this is I can click on this in the computer program, and it'll take me to that point of the operation so I can get information on what happened. I'll play the video again, and when you look at it, you will see that the suture gets caught around the atrial appendage and both the surgeon and the assistant pause for it, you know, a quick, second or two to undo the suture. There it is. And that will just, that little movement will change the motion pattern. So we're not missing anything with this data and it's pretty interesting. Um, this is just a slide to show um, one of the uh, cardiac surgery fellows and a faculty person, um, mainly to show the interesting thing that Faculty tend to be a little more ambidextrous. So this faculty person is using their left hand, has a larger working volume um, and more movements here than the, the fellow. There is a pattern here. This is from the surgeon's hand to the patient, surgeon's hand to, to the patient. You can see that the faculty actually has more idle time uh, during um, areas on the patient side than the, than the fellow, but they're, there are less movements here, one, because they're assisting themselves more, but also they're taking the time where it matters and you don't have to redo things. And um, we're able to, to capture that. And I think, you know, when you're wanting to be precise and give high level detail information to someone, you know, telling a fellow, you know, you should slow down in these places or for this, um, see, for them, it's one thing for them to hear it from us. It's another thing for us to show them in the OR. It's another thing to look at their own data compared to yours um, and see the difference in um, the, the work effort. Um, 
And again, this is tie, highly tied to, you know, your cognitive reserve in your planning. Um, not only smoothing your movements, but smoothing your thoughts and your execution. And when that unexpected thing happens, you have the reserve to calmly address it and direct your team. Another thing we've had fun doing is putting people <laughs> at a decision-making point in an operation. And this was, a, this was a project that we did with Intuitive Surgical uh, with the robot. And we built what we call the bleeding pelvic tumor. We didn't tell the participants that. We told the participants that, you know, we wanted you to dissect this tumor in the pelvis and we're tracking your motion. Um, but what they did not know that regardless of where they started their dissection, that at some point they were gonna get into torrential bleeding. And we wanted to capture that, their reaction to that bleeding. What was their planning? You know, how, how did they approach it? So this is someone who uh, got a hold of the bleeder. A lot of people took different strategies. Um, you can see there's still some bleeding over here, but at least they've got the bleeder in place. Um, we saw some of the things that went well, and we saw a number of things that uh, didn't go well for some people. Uh, this is one of them trying to change from one hand to the other to get a better grip. Um, one of the things we noticed was the idle time was different. Um, one person at one person was just shocked um, and and they froze in a little bit until you know uh, redock some new new instruments. Um, their idle time was the longest, uh, the shortest one in terms of and and our idle time measurement was in terms of the time that it took for you to control the bleeding. And this person, you know, strategy number two was just clamping the vein with what instrument that you had in. Um, and most of them had, you know, a grasper and a, and a, a some scissors uh, cutting. And so the shorter, the people with shorter idle time just grab the vessel right away and then ask for different instruments or a suture. Whereas some people, um, you know, struggled what, what to do right away. And obviously that has a difference in, in the amount of blood loss uh, we had a bunch of junior residents and then a fellow, and um, you know some people were more effective uh, in their strategies than others. So when I think about the benefits of of digital tracking, uh, I, I think that it has an enormous opportunity in terms of giving us information um, that we actually aren't able to provide either because there's no language for it or just in terms of tracking, um, human beings aren't able to track force uh, and motion. Um, we can pinpoint and we know when someone's not moving and we can give, you know, high level feedback. But I think that that with this technology, we definitely can move our profession forward um, with respect to uh, quantifying what it is that we do as surgeons capturing that information, sharing tips and tricks amongst the masters, as well as um, shortening the learning curve to competency for residents and the learning curve from competency to mastery. Um, I think that this will really facilitate uh, what we do in surgery. You know, most times when I give this talk, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, you are, or in, instead of asking this, are you charting, you know, a very dangerous uh, path here, you know, because you know, in medicine, we tend to use assessments to rank surgeons and they're high stakes, you know, and the, getting the board to say, you know, the, the, another famous question, you know, like, okay, great, this is really cool. When are we going to be able to use this for credentialing? And I'm like, oh my goodness, we have to really um, understand what the data really means um, with respect to uh, outcomes. And so a lot of my studies, what we do is we look at, and as I've shown in here, instead of um, looking at the number of years in practice someone has, number of procedures they do. We do capture that information, but our first look at the data is separating those who got the intended outcome from those who did it, and then looking at what motion and operative planning and workflow led to that good outcome. What did they do and what didn't they do to get that great outcome? And then compare it to those who didn't get a good outcome. And I think the goal is really to share that data. So it's my belief that before we even talk about credentialing, um, that it's more on the side of uh, information exchange um, amongst practitioners. The irony again, you know, I guess because we're using this in a simulation environment as a beginning, that's also a lower bar, low stakes. 
Um, there hasn't been a meeting that I've gone to in the past 20 years with using a variety of sensor technology where this isn't the scenario. Clinicians line up by the hundreds. People want this information. The conversation that takes place here, people come back the next day, they bring their colleagues, they stand around, and they have a conversation with each other that they say they've never had before. It's like, well, you do it this way, right here. You know, um, your pattern looks different than mine. And, and it enables uh, a, a new conversation that's actually quite refreshing. And so my goal and the goal of my team and my colleagues and we're partnering with the American College of Surgeons is really to promote information exchange um, and sharing and, and really have this be a ground up scenario. By the time we get to credentialing, I think we'll have a better understanding of the data and what it means and um, you know, how to, again, do precision uh, coaching, data-driven coaching um, with people who may need it. So um, in addition to you know, this data uh, being useful from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint or an individual standpoint, it's also useful from a team perspective. Um, I think they, they, uh, one scenario is a number of times, you know, that the charge nurse comes in the OR to ask, you know, where we are in the operation, how much longer. If you have this data streaming and you're, you know, the, the operation, you will know where you are in the operation based on the instruments you're using, the pace, um, and having this type of data, you know, we really facilitate our, our, our communication with, with team members, not only the circulator, the nurse, everybody in the room. Um, again, I've said this a number of times, but I, my dream is for everyday use and it just be a part of what we do as surgeons. Um, I'm in it for the long haul. I know we've got a lot of work to do to get there. Um, what's exciting is that the engineers are starting to partner with us in building technologies that are lower profile and wireless so that we can use them in the operating room. Um, I've already worn one of the sensors in the OR. And, you know, again, just a team perspective, this is an EEG sensor. And you can tell when um, I'm super focused on anatomy, um, the brain waves change from blue to yellow to red. Um, or if I'm, you know, intently watching um, a resident as they're dissecting. And I think this is an example from that, you know, that would be probably not the time for the circulator to leave the room if you're focused on some difficult anatomy and they can already see, you know, your brain waves or something. It, it's just an example, but uh, we had lots of conversations. The nurses themselves wanted one. I'm like, that would be great because I would love to know if you're really with me in this operation and you're, you know, in tune to not phasing out or sleeping on me. So um, I think there's lots of, lots of um, team communication uh, that can happen with this technology at all levels. So thank you very much um, for your time and I'll stop sharing so we can here are some of the questions that you all may have. Thank you so much, Carla. A great talk. And um, it, it just raises so many interesting questions about, you know, how we teach residents now, how we'll recertify in the future. And um, I'll, I'll pause here and uh, open up uh, the forum for, for questions and discussion. So Carla, we have a comment uh, from uh, from the crowd. First of all, great, great talk. Um, and uh, Dr. Trago mentioned, I love to see the results when I was learning stapes surgery. So <laughs> stapes is one of the most complicated yeah. surgeries, uh, ear surgeries that requires a lot of dexterity. Um, but as you know, uh, or uh, ENT department has a, a great tradition on uh, simulation. Um, but mostly has been task simulation or uh, augmented reality simulation. We haven't done much uh, with sensors. Uh, this is a, an open invitation to, to join us uh, using simulators. Uh, no, I mean, and that's the, the benefit of the wearable technology. It's procedure agnostic because the, the sensor is on the surgeon. So I can capture what you do when you're gardening, um, <laughs> if like you're so inclined, but uh, any procedure in any simulation that you have, we can definitely collect data. And we have a strategy for how we do it. We obviously, you know, collect the data from people who've done this before. So that we, you know, there's limitations to some simulators, but what someone who's super experienced does on a simulator 
represents the, you know, criterion performance that then, you know, we can capture data from all experience levels and different approaches. And at what point in the operation is there a different approach? And we know that, that people use different instruments. Um, they may do step A before, you know, step B before A. There's some small changes. The interesting thing, um, I do want to say it's so funny. I remember being warned by a number of surgeons that, you know, that you're, everybody does it differently. You're not going to find anything. And um, as it turns out, because the motion data, the final motion pattern is respect to the patient's anatomy, it doesn't matter what instrument you have in your hand. And it doesn't matter whether you're someone who does step B before step A, because the final picture of that motion profile will be the same for those who get it right, those who are efficient. You know, bigger differences in path length and number of times moving back and forth in depth perception will change it, you know, in a different way. But changing steps and changing instruments won't change the data. So there is, we are more alike than we think we are. Um, Carla, thank you so much for giving this really fascinating talk. I, I found it really interesting. Um, I was wondering if, you know, I'm one of the endoscopic sinus and skull base surgeons in our department, and I bet there's a lot of similarities between that and laparoscopic surgery. And I was wondering if you, any of this data has looked at the amount of pressure that is being applied to the tissue, because I know in our type of surgery that that can make a big difference as, as to what the outcome is. And I was just wondering if you've looked at that at all. We have not looked at it um, directly. There was a group at UCLA uh, many years ago who had um, these paper thin wafer sensors that they actually put on the end of graspers, some of the laparoscopic graspers, and they were looking at, you know, grasping force. Um, because we're doing it in a simulated environment, putting sensors on the tissue side is actually kind of complex. We can do it, um, but uh, that's something that we do have fabric sensors. And so if you want it to simulate um, some organ or some component, we could actually put the fabric sensor over it and look at, you know, how people are grasping things. Um, but that, that has been a little difficult. Um, one of the things we just learned today from one of our engineers who was a postdoc in our lab and now is a faculty person at the Technion um, in Israel, we are now looking you know, because we tend to put a, a sensor on the, um, the thumb as well as the index finger and the wrist, the distance between those two sensors, even a millimeter, they can see the difference. And so we are, we can indirectly get um, sort of hand differences in hand use. And maybe it's not going to be force, it's still going to be um, a derivative of force. Um, but there's ways to, there, there are some more ways to try and get at that. I would have to see uh, the simulation that you have um, for that, and we could definitely come up with something. One of the questions I had, Carla, uh, was, you know, you, you looked at several different models. You started with this pelvic exam model for your PhD, and you, you've studied all sorts of different procedures from the interotomy last year at the Moscone to studying this mesh uh, hernia repair. You know, our field, otolaryngology is so diverse, and, you know, and yet, you know, and I, I'm immediately thinking, well, what's the best way for us as a specialty to measure surgical skill? Like, is it a tonsillectomy? It's one of the most commonly performed procedures. Or is it a thyroidectomy? Is it an endoscopic sinus surgery where, you know, Zara wants to make sure that someone's not too rough near the orbit um, and that too much pressure issues. As a field, do you have advice about which index procedures we should start to think about? And, and, and is it an impact on the patient population, or is it sort of a finding something that's convenient for us to begin to study these these differences and, and these important benchmarks and metrics you're describing? Yeah, no, thanks for that question, because there are a number, as we start to have these conversations with a number of groups that are wanting to partner, um, it the general strategy is to, to look at a specific outcome that you want to understand better and you know what might be the metrics 
you know, it's almost looking at it from a diagnostic standpoint. You know, we have some procedures. So if it's operative time, you know, if there's wide variations in operative time for one procedure, you know, nationwide, maybe not even just at Stanford, but combining, you know, even locally, UCSF wants to play and partner as well. I don't, I don't know if you, if we're arch rivals with them in your department or not. I don't know, but I mean, there's lots of, lots of folks in the area that want to play. And you think if you look at operative time, for example, that's one, and you can, you can peel it apart. And some people, you know, don't want to move fast, or some people want to stick with the instrument they have. But sometimes this one little different thing um, can make a huge difference. Uh, with respect to that. And, and I think the argument in favor of looking at operative time for some things is, is, you know, one thing for the surgeon to have their way of doing things, but, you know, it does have an effect on, on the patient in terms of the amount of anesthesia they receive. So operative time is one. Blood loss as well. You know, we never really, we look at overall, you know, I think about it in the OR, we, we look at blood loss as one number. But we don't really capture where blood loss is taking place within an operation, you know? And, and so we could, because we have the uh, video synchronized with motion, we can understand two things. One, where's the bleeding happening for different people? Um, and is there anything that they're doing from a technical standpoint that's causing that or not doing, you know, in terms of the setup with their assistant or just different things. And, it, and the irony, a lot of this, what we're learning is that uh, some of the, the best, most important pearls don't have to do with technical skill. We've always thought that as surgeons. I think it's because we're so competitive. It doesn't have to do with technical skill. It has to do with rule-based errors. And a lot of these things we've never measured. And depending on you know, where you train, uh, this is the way we were trained, and this is the way we do it on the West Coast. This is the way we do it on the East Coast, and you just make a decision to do it that way, but we've never studied it. And it may turn out that one of the things that you were trained to perfect and you're really good at it is actually not the most efficient, bloodless way to do it. Um, so, OR time, blood loss, um, even patient outcomes, um, patient satisfaction, those, if you pick those outcomes, and look at those that have the widest variance, that's the one to, to, to look at. And maybe pick two, because I think we, we have the ability to do more than one. Pick two of them and then let's see what, what is the diagnosis? Why is there such a difference and where, what step of the procedure has the highest variance? You know, for example, um, that, what step of the procedure accounts for the, the variance that we're seeing on the end? So, we could kind of go through and look at that. Uh, Carla, this is Davut Sarjani. I'm a head and neck surgeon. And I, I apologize. I, I missed the first 10 minutes of your talk because our tumor board went over. Um, my question is, how did you decide on the sensors that I saw? Um, and did you try any of the off-the-shelf uh, commercially available gloves that are made for rehab um, for stroke patients, uh, for rehab, they, there, there are these gloves that you can put on, it clips on the outer part of your hand, so it wouldn't interfere with your, with your ability to operate. And um, I'm currently actually talking with a company in town called Neo, the, the, the glove is the Neofect uh, glove, uh, and they may give us one for um, just as a loaner, uh, because I, I loved your talk, and I think it's really important um, um, the, the things that you've highlighted are, are really awesome. Did you look at um, off-the-shelf equipment? And number two, did you look at parameters in terms of the number of uh, steps um, between a novice and, and the attending? Like how many, how, to, to document inefficiency, for example? Oh, yes, yes. So, so thank you for those questions. Um, yeah, we we are uh, we are definitely in the business of trolling a lot of different sensors. I have no desire to reinvent the wheel. So the one that I showed you actually is an off-the-shelf sensor, the um, the magnetic motion tracking sensor. Um, it's the software that we had to um, partner with the company to help us synchronize that sensor with our data 
Um, and so uh, that's the, that is one of the hard things we're finding is that a lot of people that make the really, really cool and different type of hardware, they're not data scientists and they don't know how to, they don't build their software to capture things that clinicians do. Um, most of the, the wearable technologies are calibrated and the software that supports it is built for athletes who are doing, you know, quick movements, quick 10 second, you know, two minute movements, not a four hour surgery or a two hour surgery for that matter. And so we've um, done a lot of work in partnership with a, a lot of the hardware groups in terms of modifying their software for our profession. Um, the, your second question, I'm sorry, it related to the different the number of steps. Um, for example, did you uh, just to demonstrate that the novice surgeon has is inefficient because they do they, they, they make more they, they take more not just not just the longer time, but the number of steps taken to complete the task. Um, they're yeah. making have you looked at that parameter? Yeah, one of the examples, yeah, and one of the examples I showed was the, uh, in the very beginning, the first one is just, you know, they're making rule-based errors, not tying and pulling your um, suture tail as opposed to your needle tail size, you know, too long. And then your working volume is, is really big and you're doing all this extra work trying to reach that uh, suture. And this was under a microscope. That was the one that, one example that I gave. So there are a lot of execution errors if you will, rule-based errors. And, and again, um, those are easy to fix once you show someone that. Um, That's good. The, you know, yeah, there are a number of examples of those. Death perception um, is another one. Not assisting yourself. Yeah. Um, and those yeah. things tend to, to um, and, really take a, take a toll on, you know, your execution. I, I loved your experiment about the different uh, tissue types. And I wanted to know if, you know, going along what Zara uh, asked, um, have you considered uh, repeating any of those experiments with um, sensors on the different tissue types so that you can correlate it with the operator's movements on how aggressive they're being? Because you can put a conductive rubber that is being uh, constantly monitored with a uh, just, you know, simple... Um, um, uh, Res uh, resistance, basically. If you have a conductive rubber, you connect it to a, um, a voltmeter and you're checking for resistance, as the operator is manipulating that tissue or suturing it, it will record um, in real time, you know, 100 points a second, basically, um, on how much stretch is being actively applied to the tissue that's being operated. Yeah, we have not done those studies. Um, um, many of the studies that I've done, most of the studies I've done have been based on a need um, and the partner. So a partner comes with me and they're ready to go and they, and they have a specific need. And so I'm hearing from you all that this has come up more than once that you want to, you know, not only have the motion of the surgeon, but the actually in effect on the tissues. Um, and definitely that, I know the importance of that information. The irony is all of my work before I started putting scissors on surgeons, I was putting scissors on mannequins because I know that that's the important part. Like I, I want to see all of your movement. What is the effect on the patient side of things? Um, once you start to get to cutting um, with the scissors that we have, they were physical, the X for the poor sitting resistor, you know, I, I was limited in the procedures that I could approach that way. Um, in other scenarios, we use all of them. Um, we use both sensors on the mannequin side as well as sensors on the on the surgeon, and we're able to get more information. So it's really a fabrication question. Um, there's a lot more um, sensors that are available to us today than there were 20 years ago when we first started. So we do have fabric sensors. There is an expert here um, at Stanford in uh, flexible, stretchable, super thin, super sensitive sensors. Um, obviously, when you get, get to that level of expertise, they are a little more expensive. So I would suggest if we were going to partner um, with looking at end effect on tissues that we would use some of the fabric sensors that we have. They're stretchable. Um, and um, just as you said, uh, David, have a conductor and we can um, tell when they're suturing and stretching uh, that material. 
So we have that capability in our lab from a fabrication standpoint. Well, that was an outstanding ground rounds. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Carla. This is Lisa Orloff. I would just echo what everybody else said that your talk was fantastic and your work is inspiring. I was just wondering if you um, have thoughts to use it to help with resident selection for surgery. We always struggle with how, you know, how to know who's, who's both teachable and who even has some fundamental hand-eye coordination um, that uh, we would want to select for our residency training programs. Is there, is there a thought to, to, to doing that? Um, so there's lots of conversations around that. It always makes me make me smile. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. How do you, how do you, how do we pick our, our people? The, the, there are some groups that are doing that. Um, I believe it's orthopedics uh, who have some of their it's part of the interview is to do a task or a skill or something that they have. I've heard this over the years. The irony for me, you know, if I had a chance to test someone, I think if you're testing the residents that you want by that time, it's just thinking it from the perspective of the residents themselves, it's almost too late. You know, um, what I learned when we were studying some of this, um, and let's see how much time, I don't want to tell like a long story, I'm a story tell, we got one minute left, great. Um, <laughs> the person who designed the IQ test um, did it because they wanted to predict um, who would get the Nobel Prize, right? So, so uh, it turns out that three people got the Nobel, Nobel Prize in a time period that did not do well on this test. And it turns out it, it related to the physical sciences. They didn't have it right. That spurred a number of studies into the physical sciences. And it turns out that, um, and surgery is one of them, we, we use our hands and we look at things and we do things. Um, it turns out that you decide who you are in the world in terms of that expertise and that knowledge by the time you're 11. So that's when we should be looking at haptic <laughs> scores and haptic skills when you're in, you were in junior high and high school and telling people you would be an excellent surgeon. So I want to stack the deck well before, by the time you finish medical school and you're a resident, you're interviewing, oh my goodness, we've already done your disservice. We didn't give you the information before. Don't waste your time or you're perfect. Like I think there's some people who are not coming to us because they never would even think about it. Um, but I, I, I'm excited to do that study. And I think the best way we had started it in, in, uh, when I was in Chicago, we had a partnership with the Museum of Science and Industry was just getting ready to do that because all of the high schools bring their kids there and elementary schools and it was great. And then I moved. Oh. <laughs> so let's let's do something, you know, um, with Palace of Fine Arts or uh, I forget the, the, the place there, the Exploratorium. Let's do a Stanford Exploratorium study and, and pick out the, the future surgeons in the world. I'd be happy to do that. That'd be really exciting. <laughs> great idea. <laughs> Terrific. And it, and, and that's and that's a great way to end it tonight. It's uh, it's a little after seven. Carla, thank you again. A round of uh, virtual applause. And um, we're hoping to find a lot of exciting ways to collaborate with you in the future. Thank you again. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.